Welcome to a special episode of the Cross Border Interviews, where today we will be diving deep into the province of New Brunswick. We have an engaging lineup of discussions that will be shedding light on two critical topics shaping the political landscape within the province of New Brunswick, Policy 713 and Bill 45. One of the first topics that we'll be discussing is Policy 713, a matter that has sparked heated conversations and differing opinions among educators, parents, and advocates. There have been claims suggesting that this policy restricts teachers from using a child's chosen name or pronouns informally. However, it is important to state that a Department of Education spokesperson clarified late Thursday that teachers and staff are only prohibited from using a child's chosen name without parental consent in an official capacity. We'll also be delving into the details of Bill 45, better known as the Local Governance Commission Act. This bill aims to establish a new body responsible for overseeing conflict of interest and code of conduct complaints, as well as facilitating funding agreements for regional facilities among municipalities. However, a number of municipal groups in the province have raised concerns about a specific provision within the bill that grants the Minister of Local Government the powers to amend or repeal municipal bylaws. We'll be exploring the potential implications of this bill and the impact on local governments within New Brunswick. We'll also be taking a broader look at the issues facing municipalities in New Brunswick, touching upon the urban-rural divide that may exist, and doing this, we'll be joined by two St. John councillors, Brent Harris and Joanna Killen. They will be providing their valuable perspectives and insights on the matters, and they'll be shedding lights on the challenges and opportunities that are faced by municipalities within the province. So stay tuned for an insightful and thought-provoking episode. First off, I want to both thank uh, Councillor Harris and Councillor Killen for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. But I want to start with the big question, and it's the basic hypothesis of this show. What the heck is going on in New Brunswick? I have not seen more news from the province of New Brunswick in the last three weeks than I think I have covering politics on a national stage over the last 10 years. So for two people, for two councillors in the province, give me your brief synopsis of what is going on and why is New Brunswick making the headlines so much? We'll start with uh, Joanne first. Sure. Uh, thanks, Chris. So it has been a whirlwind uh, for sure. So one of the big things that we are seeing from our current premier Higgs is, oh, and this has been going on for, I'd say, about two years where you're seeing a very large amount of bills and policy changes, et cetera, being pushed through these sessions. And for the opposition, it's a lot of uh, work for them to go through all of it. And it's it's becoming very obvious that this is a big push for centralization and a lot of these policies and bills that he is proposing and pushing through. Um, some of it has to do with limiting the, uh, uh, actually eliminating the elected seats for the regional health authorities and for the district education council. So limiting democracy there, uh, changing rules for municipalities, uh, saying that they would be able to uh, supersede on bylaws that have to do with potentially zoning and all kinds of other things. The, the wording there is very vague. Uh, and then you have the, what we would call on our podcast, and the Polypod, uh, an attack on the LGBTQIA plus community with uh, the changes that have actually been a gone through uh, on policy 713, which protects trans and queer children in, in schools from, you know, having their pronouns uh, respected and their, their gender identity and their name respected in, in the school. So that's super abridged. There is actually even more bills and policies that are happening, changes that are happening very quickly that are rather alarming to all of us who are in politics and also the broader community. And as you're seeing uh, on a national level, and I was talking to you a little bit before, there's all these sort of newscaster types on TikTok now picking up the issues happening in New Brunswick. So you're seeing a, a ton of people outside of our area have eyes on us. And so I'm glad to be here to, to be able to sort of unpack that with you and uh, Councillor Harris over the next little bit. Brent, uh, does it does it put a bad light on New Brunswick? Because traditionally, from someone outside of the province, when I, I think of New Brunswick, I don't think of Bill 713 
or even Bill 45. Like it just doesn't scream that type of province to me. For someone who was on the ground who got elected municipally in the last municipal election in the province, did you think you'd be talking about these type of issues when you were oh. doing your job? <laughs> No, I, I I mean not not a chance, and I mean it's staggering to me that you know we had a snap election that Joanne and I both ran for ran in uh, before we ran for council. We both ran for the Greens in 2020, and that was a snap election because the narrative and the word was we can't get anything done as a government because we don't have majority. So they ran an election against you know the hero of the parliament, Kevin Vickers, who was supposedly the dude who shot the the terrorist that broke in and went after Stephen Harper and turned out it wasn't even him. And he got in all kinds of trouble as an Irish um, diplomat and uh, in Ireland. And he came back to New Brunswick and tried to run for those liberals. Right. To, and didn't, didn't win. And, and uh, we were all caught flat footed. No one was ready for an election, uh, least of all us, but um, we ran, for the greens in that election and, and and we knew that there was a lot of interesting things happening in that minority government that were far more important far bigger issues to solve and so you know what we we knew that higgs who had this history of being the financier uh finance type and you know certainly was the cfo for irving oil this massive you know oil company here that has a stranglehold on the entire province. It's borderline oligarchic. You'll hear that said a lot. I know uh, Canada Land has um, a, a couple of series that cover that relationship. So, But we at least knew if the PCs got in as a majority, it's mostly going to be about fiscal conservatism because, you know, east of Quebec, um, there does the conservative movement or the conservative groupings here out east are far different especially in Atlantic Canada, than they are out West. Um, and and so you kind of look at the Tim Houston and Blaine Higgs and Dennis King, progressive conservatives, of having, you know, probably more in common with Doug Ford now uh, as, a, as a conservative. But no, I mean, there was no sense that we were going to be digging into these distracting, seemingly insignificant, but also clearly significant issues of taking away democratic process like like councillor killen said like joanna said um you know taking away looking at a policy it, it just it blows my mind that they're in a majority situation and they are this close by next week we could be in a snap election like they said hey we need a majority government so we can get things done and then they kept talking about say look we're growing the population new brunswick just hit eight hundred thousand people you know, we're still the same size as, size as Mississauga, for God's sake. But like, you know, and and uh, we're going to do all these things. And hey, we're growing and we're getting industry here. And we're we're finally on the right. And we balance the budget and we have surplus and they have all these talking points. And so they have all this ammunition to solve really systemic, systemic problems. And there is a range of them that need to be fixed in New Brunswick. Besides the global ones, we all have to fix. Right. But then there's some very specific ones in New Brunswick. So we're like, great. Well, maybe they'll focus on that. Well, no, now they're just like, hey, let's take a policy that we wrote two years ago and let's just mess with it for no reason. Like, let's just take that policy 713, pick it up and call a review. Why? I guess because they had a couple emails saying that people were uncomfortable with some minuscule and, and completely misunderstood part of that policy and situation in our school systems. And so it's like, is, you know, solving whatever discrepancies in policy 713 this like major issue is getting rid of our regional health authorities and district education councils really that big of an issue is trying to rein in and centralize power in Fredericton a good idea when we have stuff that we could feasibly do around renewable energy and energy policy and comprehensive tax reform and municipal reform and climate action and all this uh you know so it is baffling that we're here and we may they may not be able to hold on to a majority government because of how incompetent and how um disjointed this party has become uh anyway it's well it's, it's crazy it, it it's it brings up a subject that joanne and i were talking about off the air before we were while we were waiting for brent to jump on but yesterday so thursday because this will be coming out later on friday afternoon Thursday morning, uh, the Higgs government introduced policy 713 rewrites and mm -hmm. eight 
MLAs from the Conservative Caucus, six cabinet ministers, which I've never heard cabinet ministers doing this, and That's two backbenchers announced that they were not going to be sitting in the Legislative Assembly. They were very upset about the transparency and the lack of consultation around 713. And yep. Blaine Higgs, to his credit, was asked a question about an election. And he said we would be willing to go to an election. I'm paraphrasing right now. And this is where you're talking about this snap election. Mm -hmm. Is this a hill that people need to die on in New Brunswick? Like when, as a municipal councillor, I'm assuming you're hearing about these issues as well. And you're not just hearing it from the news, but you're hearing it from residents. Is Bill's policy 713 even on anyone's lips when you're talking to them? Or are they talking about housing? Are they talking about affordability? Yeah, they're talking about housing. That's, I mean, we'll get into that later, I'm sure. You know, they're talking about housing. There's climate action discussions. Like, Jesus, just south of here, we had Boca Quebec on fire in St. Andrews. And, you know, I was just talking to a volunteer firefighter today who put in 52 hours on top of his normal job last week down there putting out forest fires. And um, it the these things, again, we found out, the minister said, I've been inundated with emails yeah. about policy 713. And I don't know if you remember, Joanna, like, Kelly Lamrock or somebody said, hey, I don't think that's true. Yeah, so he was a, he's the child youth advocate uh, yeah. who is a lawyer and reviews these types of things and then makes comments. So he was able to access information about, you know, the overwhelming surge of supposed, you know, uh, feedback about this policy. So I think it, it's a distraction. It's an unfortunate traumatic event for this community. Um, and, you know, these these fellows and ladies and gentlemen um are are really playing with fire and playing with community uh with community peace honestly this was not something that was on anyone's radar and now it's divisive and it's absolutely you know tearing friends apart and people apart and the teachers don't want it there's a whole thing where you know they're saying that you'll get this personal support care inside the schools we know for a fact that our school system doesn't have enough child psychologists and support for mental health and all that kind of stuff so now you're saying that you need to add another layer it just it's very complicated and frustrating situation and you know the eight that did not participate in the morning yesterday they're calling them the eight um uh, good for them but you know they didn't sit out for the rest of the day they were back in session making sure oil and gas was alive and well there was a really yeah. important fracking bill that came uh across the afternoon they were all sitting there and all voting against uh canceling oil and gas developments in new brunswick so there it was back to you know business as usual so i'm not a, i'm not necessarily a huge fan of that move that they made because it didn't seem to have any lasting impact and breaking news here, I don't know how frequent this is or how recent this is. It's only a couple hours ago. Justin Trudeau just uh, put a big call out basically saying stand against the changes to a gender identity policy in New Brunswick schools. And Ooh, uh, Justin the Trudeau prime minister. Now, like this is not the first time New Brunswick's been in this kind of trouble. Going back to your first time, Chris, or your first question, Chris, is this put New Brunswick in a bad light? It does. It shows everybody definitively what we have been trying to fight here as younger. And again, the landscape of elected officials here is 55 plus and incredibly white. And I, I'm white, so I still have to wear that. But at least I'm 33 and still work a full time job and have three kids. Um, and it's like the 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 rumor on the street has been for a long time that New Brunswick's 10 years behind. And that's why you don't hear about us, because there's nothing noteworthy to talk about other than the fact this is a weird province that's been hijacked by billionaire interests. And that and... we're very backwards. You know, we are also have been in trouble with the, the feds before because we don't have good access to abortion. Yes. So and that's so we keep getting it. And, 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 you know, we, for our part, do want to rally the public to think about this because we do not hear this on the streets. But our voter turnout you know, being, you know, south of 60% and in, in the riding I ran in last time, it was south of 40% in a provincial election. People are so disenchanted. They're not even turned in, tuned into what's happening. And that's, that's not good. And so we have to be thinking about politics different because there is a lot right now um, on the line for democracy in this province.
one of the things that I talk about with municipal councillors across this country is the apathetic nature of politics at the municipal level. Um, you talk about the 40% turnout in a provincial election. Uh, we saw in the last Ontario election, 20% was a good number for some ridings. Uh, we're seeing municipal councillors being acclaimed and not being uh, challenged in their own uh, elections as well. Is politics just something that people don't care about anymore? And I want to specifically ask that about the New Brunswick angle here, because out here in Alberta, we saw a bit of an uptick, but it was one of those weird elections where there was a two party system where people were running against each other and it was either one or the other. No, no, yeah. like black and white here. It was that Very binary. Yeah. So in New Brunswick, is there an apathetic nature? And Joanna, if I'll, I'll, I'll ask this to you. Yeah. I'll start with you. Is there an apathetic nature in New Brunswick? And is this just the Higgs government? And I'm just, we're, no, we haven't even got to Bill 45 yet. And I want to get your reaction on that. Yeah. But 713, is this engaging people? Is this people, is this getting people out on the street and saying, okay, we're not taking this anymore. We're actually going to stand up. Or is it, eh, it's the provincial government. They're going to do what they want to do. Like, I mean, we're, we're trying to fight back. I was part of a group that put together the petition that now has over 15,000 signatures on it um, because there was, again, rumors that Minister Hogan, the education minister, was getting, he didn't know where the, the emails were coming from even, if they were New Brunswickers or not. So we said, okay, well, let's get a platform going that says exactly where you're from, what's your postal code, so then we could guarantee like that that information was taken as you know, really being true. So that's been really successful. Our former mayor uh, here in St. John, Don Darling, he's like leading a huge charge. Uh, you should have him on your show to talk municipal politics. He's really, really hilarious and engaged and smart about it. Um, but he came out of his sort of retirement to get very political about this and has, uh, there's a group of folks that are leading a charge from their different uh, respective communities. So I see a lot more organization around this. It, it reminds me of when we went through our BLM movement around St. John and in New Brunswick. And when we went through the residential school, uh, when that news came out, everyone really rallied around our Indigenous communities. It was a good moment. But, you know, continuing this and getting people to stay engaged with it is always the challenge. So uh, I'm truly hoping we can keep this fire burning. But like everything, you know, that that fades out eventually. And then oh, two years from now, we're like, oh, right. We got to care about that again. Like, let's go, let's go. I so. love how you're optimistic by saying two years. Heck, Alberta, <laughs> it's like 15 minutes and it's moved on to the next subject. So like yeah. in New Brunswick, if they're lasting two years, good for you guys. Well, no, I think you're totally right. Like that's that we've been trying to keep this candle burning on 713 and get a fire started around Bill 45. So it's it's a lot for us because we do feel like we're, we're the ones, only ones caring or scream, like old man screaming at clouds sometimes. But, you know, ultimately we're just trying to, to rally folks to see that, you know, the right, if you will, is, is really well organized. So we need to be just as organized as them. I, I want to ask about Bill Hogan because he is the Dean of the house yes. who was first elected in 1998. Yes. I do my research from time to time on this show. And he is the longest serving member of the legislative assembly in New Brunswick. As of to date, he's been around. He, I, I'm assuming he knows the process of getting bills passed and doing consultations. This, I, I watched his speech yesterday in the legislative assembly and I watched him uh, go back and forth between him and Susan Holt, the leader of the Liber uh, New Brunswick liberals. Um, give me a backstory on this guy because he, he, it seems like he should know what he's doing, but yesterday in the legislative assembly, it just seemed like he was out to left field because I think he was making up changes to the policy that he had just introduced while he was in the legislative assembly on the fly. Yeah. Is that, is that, am I wrong to say that? Brent, you got to tell it, me away, like, <laughs> who, who, who Listen, is this I, guy it, and look, why, look. like, why is he in this position? Because I know Dominic Cardi, the former education minister, there was a bit of a snafu with him. Now he's sitting as an independent, but this guy was in the cabinet and then shuffled into education, if I'm not mistaken. And, yeah, and but... he was a teacher. He was the principal of Woodstock High of, School. Of and, course. And <laughs> And from what I understand from the folks like Gail Costello, she's the head of Pride in Education, she said his high school, when he was the principal, was one of the first to adopt some of these policies. And so she's very confused from what I read of her reaction to him. 
Um, and like you say, like as a, someone who should be a seasoned legislator, the performance I saw from him yesterday and, uh, and as well in his exchange with the uh, Green Party, Megan Mitten, was just absolutely not even on topic, got really into some bizarre self-harm stuff. Um, just so I don't know if he's maybe aging out of this position and just not yes. fully he's there. Disconnected, Brent. Yeah. disconnected. Yeah. completely disconnected. You shouldn't be a lot like, first of all, there's two things I would love to see. And it kind of goes to show how just disjointed it can become um, because Many of these uh, folks, you know, not uh, not very many of them have ever served in municipal politics. And I think that, it, you know, it's something we should really talk about. Where do you get, you know, your bench strength in your political leaders and in your people who are who have an ability to communicate like any other company or any other um, even in the nonprofit world, which is what I work in. It's like. We want to find people who have had prior experience and have demonstrated themselves capable with a little before we entrust them with more. And unfortunately, we don't have that reality in uh, and in our political system across the country, but it's especially glaring in New Brunswick. And you can have these legacy uh, politicians in there for 20 years. Trevor Holder's another one. Hogan's one. And there should be term limits. And there should be uh, incentive or at least some sort of requirement for these parties to pull from lower levels of government. Like if you've demonstrated yourself capable at the municipal level, maybe you get tapped to run provincially. You know, we have this strange culture in New Brunswick where we accuse councillors, and I've been accused of it, uh, you know, not by name, but the, the Chamber of Commerce president here, David Duplissy, went on a, a scathing comment on an article Um and was accusing councillors on St. John Common Council of posturing for public office at the provincial level. My comment was, absolutely. Don't you want people who are familiar with the local issues being able to champion your issues at the legislature? Would you rather have somebody who's been completely disconnected? But they believe that that's just egregious, that it's a shame that you would have anybody who's doing that public posturing. And so we have these Didn't, narratives like, here. A lot of provincial politicians just run federally for a federal seat as well. Like if they're if they're upset about municipal politicians wanting to jump provincially, shouldn't you be upset that provincial politicians are running federally as well? Federally. Oh yeah. I was going to ask you if I wonder. I wonder if that is a trend across Canada, or if that's some sort of at backward East Coast thing. Um, but it oh no. Seems, oh, yeah. welcome to Alberta. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to if you get a rural riding in Alberta, you're guaranteed to be the next MP if you're a provincial uh, MLA. So there's a stepping stone uh, uh, out here as well. Yeah, and and you know I don't have any problem with that really, but we have this weird this weird uh, narrative here. So I guess the point is is when you're in there for 20 years, you cannot help by default, but be disconnected from the day-to-day -day concerns, as well as the possible solutions to a problem. Like necessity is the mother of all invention. And if you're living on $100,000 a year, you got a staff, you got a staff, you got a car that's paid for, you've got a second home, you're disconnected. You should be barred from office by your third term. That's just my opinion. And like we can talk about institutional memory and I'm sure that I'm, I'm being way too hard on that rule and we can maybe land on four years or four terms. But some of these people have been serving five, six, seven terms, like you say, and we don't have a quality uh, landscape and the discussions show that anybody who yeah. watches the ledge, you're like, how did these guys get there? And it is mostly men, but there are women there too. And you just think the quality of, of education and, and competency and understanding of their files, their mastery of the issues and their ability to communicate it is really weak. And um, the only reason these people continue to get voted in is because we have such a nepotistic culture um and and we have a culture that's not used to engaging politically on some on some of these things uh and i blame the parties i blame the i blame the, the leading parties on this because the parties that the party level is where you should be able to have that conversation and talk about what type of candidates are we going to go after and uh that doesn't seem to be a concern of the parties it's just winning elections they don't really care about the temperature in the province they don't seem to care i mean blaine higgs was up he, there was people that brought a request for a leadership review when he was trying to kill French immersion yeah. um, back in September, and that died. 
And so now I don't know where these PCMLAs are going to find themselves who are, who are because the cabinet ministers can't vote against the government, right? Like that's cabinet solidarity. They are not, I mean, I don't know, you don't show up for question period, you don't get your votes, sure, so they can abstain by not being there. That's a play. But as far as when it comes to voting on stuff, I I believe they are not allowed to vote against the government as a cabinet minister. Um, well, they're they're allowed to. They're just going to see the other side of the cabinet table when they're not right, in yeah. cabinet anymore. Because You're we gone. saw Michael Chong federally do that with Stephen yes. Harper. But I, I understand where you're coming from on that. I want to. I want to. Yep. I'm going to ask a very weird question, but I'm just going to see if it comes true. Do we see the Higgs government fall on Bill Seven Thirteen? I think yesterday we were like, oh my gosh, it's happening. Snap election. Oh my God. Like just, you know, five alarm. And then as the dust sort of settled this morning and realizing that those folks joined the afternoon session, they're going to be there next week. Um, it, I don't see there being this mutiny that would trigger that anymore. Brent. So Thursday, we'll, we'll know next Thursday. Yeah, um, that's when the votes take place. And, um, you know, Susan Holt, for her part, as liberal leaders calling for this to be a confidence vote. Uh, David Kuhn, leader of the Greens, is saying that the premier needs to resign immediately. Um, you know, so there is definitely a there is a framework for a majority government to collapse by Thursday. I give it a 30 percent chance, which is still pretty considerable. I think he's going to bring them back in to the fold somehow. Like I think they'll, they'll let the bill die. I think that they'll be like, okay, we kicked the hornet's nest here. We pushed too far. I think they'll let the bill die. They'll try to they'll try to pull a Danielle Smith and just hide hide the premier for two months, and you know, summer vacation, change, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. try to change the channel and and uh, hope hopefully the the peasantry goes back to sleep. <laughs> but correct me correct me if I'm wrong though, but the 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 New Brunswick Progressive Conservatives are a united bunch. They're not just progressive conservatives because Chris Allen of the People's Alliance, I believe the name of the party was, yeah. just Chris joined Austin, the fo- yeah. Chris Austin, thank you, just joined the yeah. party fold of the progressive conservatives as well. This seems like something that that side of the uh, party would want to continue going through as well. I- am I wrong to assume that the that Chris no, Austin's of the alliance. progressive are more yeah. on the right right side of the group? Oh yeah, they're more like the the PPC, right? The People's Alliance okay. and the PPC have a fair bit in common, um, you know. And Chris Austin tried to tank the party, and now uh, this other uh, Desaunier is trying to resurrect it, but that's not going to go anywhere. That party's dead for all intent and purposes. Um, hey, and... we saw Danielle Smith tank a party and come back and become premier, so. Good point. It's great. Weirder things have happened, but it is bizarre. It is bizarre in this situation. You gotta, you gotta. I, I don't understand the thinking because you've got urban seats that are held by conservative cabinet ministers that are instantly going to be vulnerable because this is an urban in an urban setting. And these issues, we know how they poll historically. We know what the political science on the topic is and how urban people tend to think. So the, the the political calculus is is really rotten here. Like I don't know who is behind the progressive conservative um, kind of machinery here as far as what <laughs> who's recommending these types of moves. People have told me that no one is anymore. That it's all through Blaine um, Blaine Higgs, and it's if it doesn't come from him, it doesn't happen. If it does, then it may, they make it happen. Um, so if that's the case, this party is in, it, it, it could be in shambles. Like it could be, uh, a, a Richard Hadfield moment where this party is reduced to, you know, barely a party status. Um, I, I want to say that off the top because although the polling doesn't suggest that yet, they don't seem to show any ability to learn from shooting themselves in the foot. And you can only shoot yourself in the foot as a party so often. Uh, and for Danielle Smith and the UPC's uh, credit, they did a really good job at insulating themselves from her negatives and shielding the party away from the the perceptions. And, uh, you know, if if I don't think the progressive conservatives have anybody behind the curtain that can help them do that now, you have uh, seemingly a collapse of, of the party structure. Uh, it's all premier sensitive. It's all leader focused. And you know how um, you know how that makes people feel. Like you know how these MLAs around the premier feel. They are in fear 
they're frustrated. They, they don't think they are going to win their seats or they don't know what's going to happen. And you're seeing this revolt. And when you see that, I don't know, like it just shows a lot of fragility. I want to now turn to the second kind of big news story, and it relates more to municipalities than I thought we would be talking about. But I, I love enjoy talking about municipalities because we have two councillors here who represent the great city of St. John. I want to talk about Bill 45, which is the Local Governance Commission Act. Now, this bill is being proposed by the Higgs government yet again, and it is has some things that I'm assuming some people are okay with, but there's one part of it that I want to sort of dive into. And it's the ability for the province to supersede the duly elected members of a council in overturning municipal bylaws. If there's a complaint, the province will deal with it. And then the minister would be able to overturn said bylaw. As two municipal councillors, you heard about this probably the same time that most other people were hearing about this while you guys were in Toronto, if I'm not mistaken. And then you guys yes. got together as the Union of New Brunswick Municipalities. And I should preface this question by saying this is the conversation between the two councillors and myself. This is not a yeah. joint statement by any organization. It's just their opinions. But yeah. I want to know from you both right off the bat what type of an attack on democracy is this going on in your province when it comes to the province superseding uh, the duly elected desires of a municipality? Who wants to take that? Uh, I'll start off, I guess. So mm -hmm. yeah, we were in Toronto. We had, we had, we knew something was coming, right? So one of the things that happened when the, the majority government got into power was that they said they were going to tackle municipal reform. And to be fair, New Brunswick had about 300 municipalities um, that needed to be amalgamated in some way so that we went from 300 down to 90. So yes, absolutely wonderful check marks to them, to them for doing that. Um, but, but with that, <laughs> But however, <laughs> as with all things, you know, the legislation that was going to go with all of these new reforms was kept from us, I'd say, until sort of the 11th hour um, when they came out with this Bill 45. Uh, there, there's a really good point made by another councillor from New Maryland, Alex Shulton, that we already have a local governance act. So what they really could have done is gone in there and taken apart Bill 45, all the components of it and enhanced the LGA, the Local Governance Act, uh, instead of putting in all these policies that will, uh, sorry, putting in a bill that's going to allow them to have all kinds of vague oversight and ability to supersede our decisions. Um, so the way they went about this was really not good. And the keeping everyone in the loop, that was not a consideration. Uh, the minister now has gone on, uh, it was in the legislature saying we we were confused by the bill as a bunch of municipalities that we were, you know, complaining and all kinds of nasty stuff. So that was all said in public. You can look it up. It's become this thing where the province seems to feel that we're just a bunch of ungrateful, dumb uh, municipalities that don't know what's good for them. And they're going to make sure that things get done. It's this big theme of the Higgs government of wanting to be able to get things done faster. And that means skipping over consultation. It means not being transparent. So for us as municipalities, we think, okay, great. So if we turn down a development per se, and the province really wants to see that development, they can come in and say, no, sorry, we're going to do it anyway. We don't care. You're, you guys weren't right in your decision. Because you can say that we were ill-equipped to make a decision with pretty much any type of argument that you'd, you'd want to make, I'm guessing. Um, so Yeah. <laughs> I can imagine and, and, the municipalities yeah. are not happy with this bill as in its present no. format. Um, I, as two municipal councillors, and uh, uh, Brent, as a municipal councillor, yep. do you feel like you're being stepped on? Do municipalities no. feel like they're not even being looked at? Because I talk to municipal councillors and municipal mayors across Canada, and they say they feel like second-class citizens when it comes to provincial issues. The province comes in, dictates what they have to do, and then just leaves. FCM conference, they tried to change that narrative and say, we are an equal partner in this confederation. We are the same as the province and as the federal government. In New Brunswick, it seems like you're not even a second-class citizen. It seems like you're sewer rats compared to what the province wants to look at you like. 
it's paternalism at its it's it's incredibly paternalistic you know uh oh there you know you guys don't know it's nice you guys got voted in but you're not really capable and you know i'll put our staff up against anybody in the in the uh in the provincial staff you know the things that we have asked from our staff here in saint john we had the province come in four years ago and say hey you guys get way more money out of this unconditional grant than the native of the city and it's not fair and we're cutting you off here's 10 million dollars go figure out how to save it we only had 160 million dollars to work with so you can imagine what seven percent of your budget getting cut overnight looks like you know and we did it and we made this city you know, nothing no by no means is it perfect but we have been dumped on especially in this city and i mean there's definitely francophone writings as well that have been dumped on not to discredit anything that anybody else is suffering it's not a competition here in suffering but i'll say you know what we have to work with and everybody is always shocked when we tell them this you know, in this, the way the province has their tax structure framed, it means that Canada's largest oil refinery contributes less to this municipality than our local regional hospital does. And no one Still is shocked. Like, what I talk about, I talk to Alberta municipal councillors, and they're like, oh, no, 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 no. We love <laughs> having industry. They pay 5.7 times as much in their tax rate as a resident does. And I'm like, really? The province won't even let me raise it more than 1.7, which means industry today in St. John. And we're one of the only heavily industrialized cities on the East Coast. And we give this country the best chance at being able to realize its goals of onshoring and repatriating supply chains. We have vacant land. We have a deep water port. We have rail connection right down to U into Utah. We have two rail companies that run here. Uh, we've got an oil refiner. We've got manufacturing here. Like We have it all. Uh, but yet we can't collect and run services. We have to have the highest paid, most highly qualified, most highly competent firefighters just to be on standby because of the high risk factor that this heavy industry presents to our city. And you can't tell me for for a minute that the province understands that because if they did, they'd stop handcuffing what could be their prize pony, right? Like we saw Ontario do it and we've seen Alberta do it with Calgary and, and Edmonton. I know that there's always concerns and we municipal elected officials, we always hear that, but it is a different level of shit that we have to deal with as municipal councillors in this province. Is there and a rural no urban divide? Is there an urban rural divide in New Brunswick? Because you talk about the Francophone and the Anglophone uh, uh, cities, but I can imagine there's more than just the urban rural divide. There's the Francophone Anglophone divide. There's the uh, North versus South divide as well. Yeah. Are, We've is done the a province... comparator. Uh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, is the province yeah. pitting municipality against municipality when it comes to funding and comes to who's their favorite and who's going to get the uh the the next big uh box facility or the next big development uh grant from the federal of the provincial government to build 200 homes 500 homes because it seems like that for me from an outsider's perspective yeah, I think there's a lot of rural urban divide, uh, Anglophone, Francophone divide. But, you know, what we witnessed in that meeting in FCM, though, was the fact is, uh, despite our differences around rural urban, despite our differences, uh, Francophone, Anglophone, uh, we all agreed Bill 45 was bad. So it was kind of this, <laughs> you know, interesting beacon of light in our cooperation abilities to to realize, you know, Maybe we should be a little less, yeah, a lot of solidarity, like less rural versus urban, less Anglophone versus Francophone, where it's us versus the province. And that's that was pretty powerful to witness and be a part of and to not feel alone. And that, you know, all these other municipalities feel the same way about the way we're being treated. So, but historically, and especially when it comes down to those provincial elections, uh, the rural ridings hold more seats. We have a gargantuan ledge of 49 representatives for 800,000 people. And we've done an analysis on our podcast about um, the Ontario um, uh, OPP. And, you know, they represent, what is it, Brent? Like one per 60,000. And here it's yeah. one per eight, one per 8,000. 14. One, so yeah, 14. I, I, yeah, a member. Uh, yeah. So for example, I'm a counselor at large. So I would represent 72,000 people or about 21,000 voters out of which I got 8,400 votes and, you know, the vote, low voter turnout, whatever. Um, so, you know, that's my municipal footprint. Um, Joanna, you would be a ward councillor and would have, yep. I, I want to say, probably 20,000 people on the west side that you're responsible mm -hmm. to. And uh, But you look at a member of our legislature, they're responsible to 14,000 people. We're over-governed, we underperform, and we've been hijacked on so many fronts. 
And I am a big believer in democracy, but in this case, less is more, right? Less, you know, we we have 55% of the population lives in an urban setting, but yet 50, I think it's 58 or 59, uh, our friend John Taylor, Taylor did a yeah. did an analysis on every riding where every MLA is. And what they found is almost 60% of those ridings have a rural veto, which means just by the way that they're shaped, even though majority of the population lives in urban settings. Um, and I know we don't have sprawling metropolises like Halifax everywhere, uh, you know, but we, uh, you know, anybody around 20,000 people in one spot is a bit more of an urban setting. And ours is 72,000 in our city. And, and so there's this rural veto, this rural interest that gets to dictate the, the the terms of reference at the provincial level and it started under the conservatives under louis robichaud in the 60s and uh that divide is real but there is real solidarity in this province we have three uh groups that are responsible to represent municipality we have because you know what in new brunswick we're so cool that if it's worth doing once we might as well do it three times it's like <laughs> we have we have the classic union of municipalities of new brunswick which like everybody has their U yeah. umnb or ubc uh whatever yeah. and then uh, we have the francophone version of that which is afnb and then we have the urban part of that which is eight cities and they're all on the same page this yeah. bill has to be amended uh and there's no sign that it will be um, and they'll tell you, the government will say, this was all in the white paper. This was all talked about in consultation, but try to go find it. Try to go find prior to G uh, May where this was available for digestion yeah. in the public. You can't. And so it is an outright lie. Like the, the Union of Municipalities, eight cities and AFNB and every councillor uh, or sorry, every mayor were blindsided by these proposals. And all they do is seek to entrench more power in Fredericton, which we've already done and been doing for 60 years and still seen this province trail in every category. I'm going to play devil's advocate with both of you here for a second, because you raise go. a good point. You raise about the rural urban divide and you raise that in New Brunswick, there seems to be more weight for rural municipalities or rural areas compared to urban centers. Mm -hmm. Are you just saying that because you're urban councillors? Like if I go talk to two <laughs> rural councillors tomorrow, they'll be like, Fredericton and St. John, they get too much of the money because they think that that's where all the people are. So they should be getting it because we see that out West, we see organizations battle it out because we need more money because the infrastructures in rural areas, like our bridges or roads and all that, but the people are in the urban center. So the urban center should get more. No, the rural, is it just the urban councillors on the show saying the rurals have too much weight? Devil's advocate. Oh, totally, <laughs> totally. I I don't no, think so. You're, no, go ahead. I go ahead, Joe. You, I yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. I I don't I I don't think so either. I I feel that I've always wanted to figure out how to build more bridges. It never made sense to me why we weren't a part of this UMNB. Uh, I mean, there's a whole history around that. But honestly, it, it to me, there's so much room for figuring out why these situations, why the policies that build New Brunswick are bad for both of us. So yeah. like, that's been my thought and goal around this one, but I, I, I completely understand where you're coming from and thinking, you know, of course it, we're going to say we deserve more. Yeah. And so I'm from Blacks Harbor. My mother was deputy mayor of Blacks Harbor and my dad was on village council. I'm from rural New Brunswick. Right. Um, and the thing is, you know, <laughs> From a just from a high level strategic planning perspective, you have to give your cities different powers because they have different levels of competency, right? But the level of ability that the city of St. John has to frame provincial realities in our so I'll give you an example. Route 101. Okay. If you go on Google Maps and you look at Route 101 in Rosse, that's just outside our city. It's more rural, it's a smaller town. And it's a bit of a neighborhood for people who work in St. John, really. But very wealthy, incredibly wealthy. One of the wealthiest postal codes in this country. And you will see Route 101 look beautiful. It's narrow. It's got traffic bulbs. It's got nice crosswalks. It's got trees. The province is responsible for that route. Route 101 that runs through this city 
looks like a desolate wasteland for motorists. Looks like an industrial speedway and people have to walk it every day. There's no crosswalk on a provincial bridge to get to a, to a school, to a provincial school within our city. We have kids who walk across this bridge every day. We've been talking about it for four years. Our MLAs have known this for four years. And so it is, when you just look at the similarity side by side, you have to say, there is a rural lean in this province and it's very obvious. Um, and it's like, it doesn't do us any good. It's a race to the bottom to see, mm -hmm. to talk about who's treated worse. But the reality is I just had a, I had a village councilor from Blacks message me and say, Hey, um, the homeless population down here is, is insane. Uh, what's it like in the city? And I'm like, it's insane. It's never been this bad. And we have got to start joining together on this issue around housing first and, yeah. and, de and decoupling the housing market from private interests if we're ever going to solve it. And that starts with us. And I think you're starting to see some common ground form between rural and urban New Brunswick. I was just re recently to, uh, speaking to a councillor from Hanwell, Pat Septon, and he said the oh, yeah. exact same thing about uh, a, uh, a high school on a highway. And I just, I, I, I was flabbergasted that someone would put a high school on a highway to begin with, but that's just, mm -hmm. that's just me. Um, but I want to talk about some of the issues you just talked about here, because I'm, I'm cautious of time here and I know you guys are both busy. Yeah. I want to turn to municipal issues and I want to ask the big question in your opinions, what are the big issues that are facing municipalities today? We can talk about bill 45 till our, our skin is red. We can talk about bill seven policy uh, 713, but for you, what are you seeing on the ground that you say, if we don't fix this issue today, it's going to be worse next year, five years from now, 10 years from now, 50 years from now. Mm -hmm. Go Joanne, do you want to start with that one? And you've muted oh, yourself. You're, you're <laughs> muted there, my friend. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Um, I think it's housing. I, I think that we all know that we are not going upstream far enough with this. It's And so I guess poverty would probably be as well linked in here. You know, we've had this stat in, in St. John that we've had the highest child poverty you know, rate for an extensive amount of time, decades. Our food bank has just celebrated its 41st year. And I look at those issues and they're very much on the backs of the cities to figure out as much as the province is supposed to be the province's lane. You know, we're the ones who provided the space for the homeless out of the cold shelter this year, the, the municipality did. Uh, and we're also created a housing fund of 800K to give away to projects to get them moving. So, you know, we're out here trying to be a Band-Aid solution all the time for issues that directly affect our citizens. And that, to me, like going upstream, having to address why we do not have spaces and beds for people with mental health issues, addictions issues, why we don't have food and housing for everyone is, is some of the stuff that municipalities aren't responsible for, but bear the burden of having to deal with those, the implications of. So... That, to me, like not going upstream far enough is a huge issue uh, facing municipalities. Right. Yeah. Yourself. yeah. It, it, it is housing. There's no way around it. Joe's right for every reason she points out. I'll just add a couple on that because their housing is really the reason I got into this game in the first place. I um, I started a little social enterprise in St. John called St. John Tool Library. And our, our problem set was run down dilapidated buildings in our inner city that we knew no one was coming to save and we knew left a left a real stain on the community and hampered to, hampered investment by people and it also hampers people's pride of place which holds back volunteerism which holds back contribution and all this stuff and so the the social determinants around rundown buildings are a big issue and we have a lot of them in this city and there's no reason for it right there is no reason for it and i was talking about this stuff back in 18 and we were talking about in, in 2019. And then when I ran in 2020, you, you know, there isn't a lot you have to do to fix the problem around some of these, like the, we reward vacancy with lower taxes. We allow vacancy when we shouldn't, we don't tax vacancy different than we do. And we should, like, there's a bunch of stuff, but that issue is now at a boiling point, right? It was a crisis in 18, even though very few people, except people who worked in the sector and nonprofit sector, especially, they knew it was a crisis in 18, because we had a huge housing wait list for people and we know what that does. Um, and now it's even bigger and it's broader and there's, there's you know, concerns over runaway gentrification. 
Um, and if we don't fix housing, uh, and if we don't decouple it from private interests and from the profit-driven motivation of the market, we're doomed. We will continue to see a massive um, uh, incapacity, I guess, at the at the um, municipal level to really thrive because our businesses won't have people to have. From a very just strict conservative sense, even if you're not worried about people as much as you are business – Business has nowhere for their workers to live. We've got three multi-billion dollar companies. Cook Aquaculture here in, in St. John is this massive growing king of the seafood industry in the world now, one of them, and came out of little St. George down where I live from nothing almost. And uh, they're buying up Spanish companies and they're buying up all these companies. They can't find people places for their people to, to work. Uh, never mind the people who live an, on an average salary and this province has now been prone to the spillover of people trying to leave Toronto and 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 out west, even British Columbia. There's a lot of them in British Columbia and Toronto and Ontario and Montreal here. And they've moved here because it's so affordable. You can buy a 2,000 square foot house overlooking the water for $270,000. And, uh, and they all gravitated toward that, especially during COVID. And now the people who live here and work here for the wages that exist here can't afford to live here. And uh, that has every, and I mean, David Coletto said it in the FCM, uh, at the FCM conference when he was referencing some of his polling data. When you see this level of fragility when it comes to shelter in your society, you see an incredible downward spiral of the, of the society's ability to survive. And it becomes weird and people start invading their own capitals and people start, uh, you know, all kinds of weird movements and conspiracy stuff. And I don't know about you, but that's, ex that's exactly what I see. That's exactly yeah. what I see. So what do you do as counselors? <laughs> what, do you, what do you do as counselors to start fixing this issue? Because you are two votes on a board, on a council, a common council. Um, yeah. You have to rally your council members to help you support the issues that you want. But give me a tangible idea right here, right now, that I can walk away and I say, okay, St. John is on a good path because this is the idea that the councillors are putting forward around housing. Can we give so you two? Yeah. One each okay. if you want, or okay, good. one each. Joe, you go okay. first. <laughs> okay, I know, I know exactly what I'm going to say. So, uh, Brent and I actually co-authored a, a, a motion to create a municipal housing entity, because what we've seen and recognized is that the province is thinking about the province, right? And we talked about the realities of urban versus the realities of urban, uh, of rural, and there's lots of data to show that you know we have half of our city that are renters uh the the gentleman who you interviewed from quiz pam says they only have 10 percent of their population as renters so we need to have a group completely focused third party uh government arms length kind of situation to handle housing issues and that it, it revolves around ensuring cmhc uh funding proposals are tickety boo make it easier for the nonprofits to submit to handle their very heavily bureaucratic organization so our nonprofits need that support uh we we would assume that would come from the entity and we'd also assume that you know any sort of advocacy to the province when it comes to uh getting new builds on the go when it comes to advocating on behalf of residential tenancy act changes things like that that there would be a coordinated body uh, able to to work on these housing issues as they relate to St. John. We've realized we can't trust the province. We need to have our own particular focus. And uh, so that's one motion that's uh, the, the st city staff are coming back with what they feel the structure would look like for an entity like this. Yeah. And, and we're, yeah, yeah, we're that one. I'm most, I'm very excited about that one. Yeah. Um, there's been a couple of things I've already brought as motions uh, to, you know, we've, I brought a motion for the city to pursue a vacant properties tax that is, you know, different. They call it a ghost house tax in other jurisdictions. So we're not incentivizing vacancy and we're not incentivizing um, dilapidation in our city. Um, so we tax them higher because they're a bigger risk factor to the community and they're not housing people like we need them to. So that's already done. And we're already working on that. And we're already working on trying to repair buildings before they become too fault to two or four, um, run down to be salvaged. That's already done. But one, one of the ones and I'll, uh, you know, we don't have to look very far for solutions. Vienna, Austria has given us the blueprint to insulate yourself from housing crisis. They've done it. 
And I don't know why more people aren't talking about it. And one of the ways they did it was by making sure that they picked the right winners and the right losers. No, I won't say losers, but they, they preferred certain winners. Let's call it like that. In okay. Vienna, Austria, you've got 80% of the city housing stock that is managed by the municipal housing entity that they have or by the nonprofit development sector. The private for-profit development sector only holds 20% of all units in that city, buildings and units combined. That is an incredibly different look and feel. Um, and they have been rewarded for it. Uh, yeah, sure, it's Vienna, Austria, and they basically have city-state status, but that is the blueprint. And so, it, you know, and when we're talking about it, the concrete solution there is incentivize nonprofit. And um, if you are going to incentivize, um, let's say, I won't say for profit, but if you are going to incentivize any other type of ownership besides public ownership and nonprofit ownership of, of your housing stock, incentivize co-ops. You can't start a co-op. So if we had a fund in our municipality and we like right now we have a there's a there's a nonprofit in this uh, it used to be called the St. John Community Loan Fund. It's now called Kaleidoscope Invest uh, Kaleidoscope Investment. What's it called? Social impact. Social impact. Thank you. I don't know why I was thinking of investments. That's why we but have both of you here. <laughs> Yeah, for all intents and purposes, they are a uh, a lending institution on many fronts. They have other stuff that they do too for the community. Um, but if we, as the city, were able to gift them uh, as for, for uh, money for an initiative to incentivize cooperative housing, where you have six people and they could access a pool of money that had different terms, because if you go to the banks, you can't borrow money to start a cooperative. It's not possible. And so it used to be prevalent it used to be a very powerful way uh to produce home ownership at a more grassroots level we haven't formed any cooperatives in this city in 40 years and and that is holding us back and all you have to do is say we're going to have a financial incentive for just that stream and it's going to be not as it's not going to be as rich as it is the private stream but we do it the exact opposite we say we need to prefer private development. The market will save us and only the market will save us. And they only have the scale and the capacity to build housing. And it's not true. The, the most, the most, I'm a builder. I swung a hammer. I've been swinging a hammer for 10 years. And the most capacity we have to build houses is at the mid-level general contractor level. They, they have all kinds of capacity to build more. They need a lot more labor for sure, but they aren't driven by the interests of an investment uh, group like our real estate investment trusts are. They don't have to care about returning a major investment to um, shareholders. They can just build houses, but they don't build and they don't scale up because they lack the investment. Um, and there's your problem, right? So anyway. He could talk about this for days. I could talk about Chris. this for days. <laughs> it's, it seems like there's a lot that needs to be done. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think municipalities have the ability to get it done? No. And I shared your post about this the other day um, because municipalities only have eight to 10 cents of your tax dollar that you spend. Right. So we are not getting what we need and deserve. And if the province could get out of this centralization headspace, um, we would know what to do with that money. Oh, yeah. We would absolutely know what to do with that money. So I think that you really need to, the provinces across Canada need to have a little bit more faith in their municipalities. And if they did, I think you would see a lot of great things happen. Oh yeah. Agreed. So my last question, and it's the big question, because the reason why you and I are talking, the three of us are talking right now is because we found each other on Twitter about yeah. a podcast. You both have the NB Poly podcast, which comes out every Thursday, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the last right. episode just was released yesterday. Why, why is it important for you guys to tell these stories on your show and give a shine a light on what's going on in New Brunswick from the municipal standpoint? Yeah, we we both started this for like both of us would just be in a room talking for an hour and a half about the problem, a potential solution, what's in the way, a, diagnosing the problem uh, properly, all this stuff. And we eventually just said, oh, my God, like this, this should just be a podcast. No one talks about this. We have nowhere to go for this information. It's not available. And so for us, but what, for us, that was kind of the starting point. We we're both very passionate about some of these issues and we were quick studies 
and we we do our best to try to go deep and do some research. Joe's really good at being able to get into the historical context and try to figure out what was happening in the 60s and 70s that maybe led to this. My part is more about trying to find ideas that are from different places and bring them and and figure out a way to piecemeal them or, or make them work within the, the fabric we have here to work with. Um, and so we work well together on that. But what we found, I guess what I found is it is a really important communications exercise uh, to be able to get on a podcast every week and talk for an hour and talk coherently and competently or try to be competent and then be able to change your mind and say, oh, I learned this this week. That's different. That's a good exercise in accountability. Like it is just a yeah. good exercise. I had to get over a lot of fears around saying the wrong thing or being mis you know, misunderstood or whatever it was. And, you know, we adopted this mindset of, okay, if you do say something wrong or misspeak, then we can apologize and move past it, you know? So I think most people don't hear from politicians unless it's in this very structured, like, here's my Facebook post that I spent like two hours writing and I had to make sure every word was perfect and all of that. When you mean they're staffers, just- right? You mean they're staffed yeah, for yeah. two hours? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, we're normal human beings here and would like to bring a little bit of humanity to politics and to, to, to get to know us better and to understand sort of how we think and why we think we, the way we do. Because when I go look to look to vote for someone, I'd love to be able to hear more about who they are, what they believe and all that kind of stuff, not just what's on their little election website. Mm-hmm. I'll go creep their Facebook and see what they're really like. So <laughs> and this even that like... can be quite sterilized, right? <laughs> yeah, even, exactly. Even Facebook can be quite sterilized. So yeah, I so agree. like that's we've had some comments saying like I can't believe you guys are doing this. You know, you're elected okay. officials, and you might not get elected again if you keep this up. And it's like, well, if I don't get elected for who I am and what I think, then that's I fine. probably shouldn't have gotten elected. <laughs> so. yeah. Um, yeah. I want to thank you both for doing this. For those who want to actually catch the NB Poly podcast, the links to their Twitter, their Facebook, and their Spotify uh, platform, where you can listen to all the back catalog, listen to yesterday's uh, show, will be in the show notes. So scroll down, check it out. Highly recommend it. Uh, it, it doesn't just t- touch on New Brunswick politics, but it is also brings the what's going on in other provinces and other territories to the New Brunswick perspective. Um, <laughs> Joanne, Brent, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, it was Chris a pleasure. So yeah, it was awesome. I want to thank both Councillor Harris and Councillor Killen for joining us for a special episode and shedding their perspective and their knowledge on what is going on in New Brunswick. To our viewers, to you who's watching this right now, thank you so much for tuning in, for being part of this conversation. Now, if you've enjoyed this episode, please hit the subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all our latest interviews and all our latest special episodes. And trust me, we have lots more coming and you do not want to miss them. Now, if you're able to, please consider backing the show to help us continue to grow and produce more shows like you watch today. Every little bit helps, and we appreciate your support. A link to our Patreon account is in the show notes below. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram for more behind-the-scenes looks and content updates. You won't want to be missing this. And finally, and this is the big one, as much as we love our phones and technology, let's remember to put them down and have real-life, in-person conversations, even if it's just for five minutes. I want to thank you so much again for tuning in for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Until next time, just remember, just keep talking.